all we can do is try to publicize the facts, not what the government's saying, but the facts, and not simply parrot or regurgitate what the government is saying, because that's largely bullshit. It was the dead of winter. I don't remember it ever being so cold. And we were on a mission. A bunch of us had volunteered to drive our good friend to his new home, the Schoolkill Federal Prison in the middle of Pennsylvania. He called himself Fiber Optic, and you'd have to look pretty hard to find someone who didn't think he was brilliant. Before we left, we had one night of fun on the streets of Philadelphia in the middle of an ice storm. Fiber learned by exploring, and was never too busy to explain how something worked to anyone who was interested. I think that's what must have pissed off the authorities more than anything. You see, they never even tried to prove that Fiber Optic hacked into any computers. They got him for conspiracy, for talking to people on a tapped phone line about how to hack certain sites. There were people who actually broke into systems and really fucked things up, and they never even got arrested. The feds didn't care. They wanted to shut down the teachers, the people who didn't know to keep secrets. There's Bernie S. He's another one of those guys who loves to explain how technology works to anyone who's interested. He didn't know it, but hell was just around the corner waiting for him. We made one last stop before we dropped Fiber off. It was a town called Frackville, which we thought was funny because there was a hacker newsletter called Frack. We thought it would make a good picture for the rest of the hacker community. But Bernie S. actually had the balls to get a Frackville cop to pose with Fiber. These guys had no clue what was going on, but they quickly got into the spirit. It was the last time we laughed that night. We drove to the prison. It felt like it was 20 degrees below zero. We didn't know they'd throw him in the hole for the entire weekend, some kind of prison welcoming ceremony. And, like the gullible idiots we were, we figured we'd have a chance to say goodbye. We didn't. They grabbed him, and we had to run out of there to keep them from taking our camera. Fiber came home ten months later a hero, and everybody seemed to know that sending someone like that to prison was a big mistake. After it was over, we were pretty sure it wouldn't happen again. Were we ever wrong? Communication I've ever had to do. One, two, three, four, five. I just saw something. Was that, was that you? I, well, we can see your hand. I, I doubt you can stick your whole head through the window. Yeah, but like, like splotch your face up against the window. Now we know it's the right one. We can at least like zoom in on it. Kevin Mitnick the world's most dangerous computer hacker. My regret about cyberpunk is talking about Kevin and how he was always eating and how he was overweight. And people have really gotten on my case about that. Uh, some guy came up to me at an Austin book thing and said, why did you go on and on about Kevin's weight? And he was right. I, I did that to the point of, to the point where it just wasn't tasteful, where it was just sort of just beating an issue that didn't need to be beaten. 
for a period after he was arrested, incarcerated, and released into a halfway house, I couldn't find a single article that talked about him without mentioning, uh, for example, his weight. And the real uh, fascination with Kevin's body and its relationship to technology uh, is one of the things that absolutely hooked me. And I found a number of articles in Time and Newsweek written by people, uh, in, and the New York Times written by people like Markoff and Joshua Quitner and, and so on. And they would say, Kevin was in a halfway house where he no longer touched a computer and lost 100 pounds, as if those two things were connected. 1988, the USA Today um, put his picture on the front page, morphed or superimposed with the image of Darth Vader. And I thought, this is a remarkable combination of two things, and it's really picking up on the idea of the dark side hacker. If ever there was someone who fit that description, it was Kevin. The mere mention of his name was enough to incur the wrath of the authorities. Over the years, his reputation grew, and so did the falsehoods. In numerous articles, Kevin was said to have broken into NORAD, harassed actress Christy McNichol, and turned his friend's home phones into pay phones. His beginning was on ham radio. And on ham radio, it's a, it's a close-knit community, a um, couple of, you know, dozen people at the most on a particular repeater or channel. And, you know, they would get into challenges. And, of course, you know, Mitnick would be the underdog. Let's challenge him. Let's do this and that. And when he met their challenges, then they'd start crying and screaming as if they were innocent victims of Kevin's. You know, this has been the case throughout. And then people would start unfairly using uh, uh, other contacts that they had. In one case, a uh, lieutenant, I think it was, or a commander in the LAPD. Um, you know, one, one ham radio operator who was a friend of him got him to write a letter saying that Kevin was interfering with LAPD communications and all sorts of crazy things in his, in his past. Cyberpunk was published in 1991 by Katie Hefner and then-husband John Markoff and it relied almost entirely on the words of people who Kevin had had a falling out with, as well as those who didn't know him at all. Hafner and Markoff never talked to Kevin because he wanted to be paid for his time. But it really didn't take much to dispel the rumors. NORAD denied any break-ins. Christy McNichol had no idea she was being harassed. And no evidence ever surfaced of any payphone conversions. But none of this ever got printed. Kevin's name was enough to convict him, regardless of the actual evidence. And then there was Security Pacific. After being hired, Kevin had once again been terminated because of the stories that followed him. And this resulted in yet another Mitnick myth being born. There was a Newswire article um, coming out that stated that Security Pacific had, you know, lost billions of dollars or something in bad loans, which would have affected their stock price. And that was actually tracked down to some error that someone made in entering the information had nothing to do with it not being true or anything like that, but it was an error that someone made in entering the information. Well, immediately, because there were people, employees at Security Pacific, that knew Kevin Mitnick, including one ham radio operator, immediately that was attributed to Kevin Mitnick did this. And that's how that rumor spread. I'd seen this all before. Hackers were always getting blamed for things they didn't do. In many cases, for things that weren't even possible. It was obvious somebody had to set the record straight, somebody who would command respect. Hackers break into government and business computers, stealing and destroying information, raiding bank accounts, running up credit card charges, extorting money by threats to unleash computer viruses. Whoa, hold on a second. What was this guy reading? The Weekly World News? Hackers don't steal and extort, they play with all kinds of things, like those simplex locks in the FedEx boxes. In typical corporate brain power, FedEx uses the same combination on every Dropbox in the country. It's always fun to stick something really big in there. It couldn't possibly fit in the chute just to fuck with the guy. And hey, he got some cheap beer out of it too. If you go somewhere you're not supposed to be and bring something back to show people, that always struck me as being a whole lot like a panty raid. And you know, panty raids are are really in the, tradi the grandest tradition of this country to try to make your way in there, get the stuff, and get back out with it without getting your head cut off. Yeah, what we're doing here is uh, we're, we're talking on the McDonald's, uh, the uh, external speaker for their drive through And what we're doing to do that is we have a modified ham radio, um, modified meaning it uh, transmits on frequencies other than the ones it was intended to transmit on. Uh, and in this case, it's that standard business band frequencies.
154.6 megahertz seems to be the standard uh, McDonald's frequency. Hey, uh, the blonde, would you please kneel down for a second? <laughs> Could uh, one of you please take off your tops? We'll give you the food for free. Bastards, you better stop getting smart. Here comes the manager. Really? While corporate America would always be the playground of hackers, it was mostly about fun and exploration, not damage or profit. But try telling that to corporate America. Kevin Mitnick had already paid a heavy price for his curiosity. He had served a year and a half in 1988 for logging into DEC computers without authorization. By simply looking at the VMS operating system, DEC claimed he caused millions of dollars in damage, and he was sentenced as if he had caused that amount of physical damage. He was also held without bail, and they put him in solitary confinement for eight months because they thought he could do even more damage from the prison payphone. After his sentence, Kevin had to serve three years of supervised release, reporting to the authorities every month and being restricted in where he could go and what he could do. And he only had a few days to go when federal authorities decided he had violated the terms of his supervised release by associating with Louis DePayne and accessing someone's voicemail without permission. It was nothing, but it was enough. Knowing how the media and the court system would crucify him over any offense because he could start World War III from a payphone, Kevin decided to just walk away. I was devastated. We were never far away from each other. Uh, and how was he living on his own without his family to share things with? I, it was horrible. What kind of a life is this? He is not streetwise. He's a home person. Kevin managed to avoid attention. Then, on July 4, 1994, everything changed. A front page story in the New York Times turned Kevin Mitnick into a household word all over again. The evil looking picture, the mythical stories about breaking into NORAD computers and controlling all the telephones in California, even the Security Pacific news release tale was retold as fact. Nobody could figure out how the story made it onto the front page of the Times since there was nothing new in the story. But the author was no stranger. John Markoff, who was quickly becoming a Mitnick expert without ever having met him. We looked at the story as an amusement back then. A bunch of us were putting together the first Hackers on Planet Earth conference that August. The story had gotten so big that we all walked around with Mitnick masks. They came here to the Hotel Pennsylvania by the hundreds. These usually anonymous creatures of the cyber world, better known as hackers, were holding a convention. Throughout that weekend, Kevin called in several times to say hi. We all wished he could be there, but we knew why he was running. One of the things Markov hadn't mentioned in his article was the eight months of solitary confinement. You know, the guy was in, in solitary confinement for eight months. Eight months. Think about it. I mean, I, I, that, would, that would definitely change a man to, to a, a several degree. You would run. You would not want that because it was eight months, not for anything he did, but because the judge was scared. And if you get someone who is that unaware of, of actually what he can do and thinks that he can destroy the world, if you have someone that has that much power over you who will put you in solitary confinement, you're going to run. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, I think it's part hype, part hysteria, part um, lack of understanding, and um, part fear. Solitary confinement means no books, no pencil, no paper, no company, nothing to do but stare at these small four walls. You would get out one hour a day, and that's it. Well, you know, he might whistle up some missile launch codes. You know, that's a big problem with hackers nowadays. They get a little pissed off and they launch some nukes by whistling, you know. Uh, the fear factor is just insane. Once or twice, or maybe more, I can't even remember, but they didn't even bring him down to the visitor's room. They took my daughter and I upstairs to a, um, a floor that wasn't occupied at that time. We were the only ones there and the guard. They were hovering over him as though he was an absolute monster. What could he possibly do? You know, could, could he make a, um, a computer out of the telephone?